allora io volevo cominciare con le domande che stanno arrivando eh, tramite la nostra piattaforma eh, se mi puoi aiutare con qualcuna delle domande io cominciavo, ne ho vista una un po' di tempo fa all'inizio per Nadia eh, se me la puoi ritrovare per cortesia se puoi scorrere eccolo qui Nadia can you read? Yes, I can read. Um, what do you think about platform where grassroots leads content innovation such as Reddit in relation to the evolution of a more people centered technology that you advocate? So I, I personally don't have a problem with a more kind of, you know, um, grassroots technical kind of led uh, platforms. I, I mean, Wikipedia is one of those and is one of the best things that, you know, uh, have happened, I think, through the internet. Of course, we need to be thinking about kind of, you know, the moderation. That's where the governance kind of aspect that I was talking, sorry, I'll take this out because it's just translating my English so <laughs> to Italian, so I'm kind of getting a bit confused. Uh, so, uh, so, yes, I did, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's too much, too much technology. So, Although personally, I, I feel the balance is, is usually in between the online and the offline. That's kind of where I feel our lives can be the most maybe healthy in some way. But I still think there's a lot of um, healthy and valuable and useful things happening in online kind of forums and spaces. I mean. A lot of uh, mental health, self-help, you know, the, the LGBTQ kind of, you know, um, debates and, and kind of, um, uh, I guess, um, conversations started online. And there's a lot of people that have found a lot of help and support through, through these kind of, uh, you know, forums uh, and, and technologies like Reddit. And, and Reddit actually is a really good example because they've had these kind of violations, let's say. So they had a lot of controversy happening in the platform and it was tackled almost within. And I think that's why it's very powerful because this is a community led, even though it's kind of technological. Thank you. Uh, please, Abir, Abir Tobji, can you, can you reach us here, please? Because Abir um, is, I, I give you my seat. I'm very happy, please. Because you, you, you follow the project at the History Museum in Manchester, no? Yes. Okay. E io ti volevo, okay. um, ti volevo chiedere se ci potevi fare un esempio di quello che state facendo per spiegarlo. Uh, do, you, you don't have... Oh, sorry. No, I have one, but you need to translate. <laughs> okay, allora, just, just explain us, please, what are you doing in this project? Thank you, <laughs> it's very easy. <laughs> okay, so um, going back to the first presentation you started to hear about so from Elena and uh, um, Irini, um, we are um, one of the four partners who are uh, implementing the pilot projects. Um, so we are based in the UK, in Manchester, uh, it's the People's History Museum, uh, and we're basically following all the methodology and all the tools that both um, the technical experts, like uh, the, the university that Irene works for, and the um, methodological approaches that Elena uh, is helping us to adopt, uh, and many of them are based on the design justice principles, uh, so we're trying to see how these principles and uh, tools and technologies can be actually used in the real life uh, situation. Um, so for example, now for our case uh, in Manchester, we're um, uh, going to explore how we can gather a lot of people from different backgrounds uh, because the city is very diverse in itself uh, and um, use cultural heritage and art basically to see um, how we have much more in common between us uh, and challenge the st status quo that says like each one has to live in their own bubble, in, in their own society where they feel comfort comfortable. 
um, and hopefully uh, produce something that can be also showcased um, to um, nationally and also internationally to, um, uh, to, to advocate this idea, basically. Um, so we'll be using a lot of digital tools to um, make these connections, um, but to the extent that uh, is comfortable, uh, people or participants are comfortable as well. Did I answer your question? Th thank you, thank you, thank you for the moment. Um, io volevo chiedere questo alla responsabile del, del, del progetto. Um, cioè voi, voi state dicendo, cioè voi dite adesso noi, noi vogliamo fare alcuni progetti culturali, no? Cultural project. Che cosa intendete per progetti culturali? Cioè che cos'è cultura? Abbiamo visto ci sono dei musei. Um, però, non lo so, ci sono anche altri, altri, altri terreni che potreste coinvolgere in questo progetto. Io mh, lo dicevo stamattina in un brief che abbiamo fatto, per esempio il cibo, la moda, possono essere settori che possono essere coinvolti nel vostro progetto? Yes, certainly. So culture is not only about the exhibitions that exist in museum. It's not about statues or paintings. Uh, it's something live. So food is certainly part of our culture. Um, and uh, intangible culture is a very uh, important dimension. So dances, um, ways in which people express. This is what culture is about. So it's not something valuable that has to be protected and be kept safe in the rooms of institutions. It's something that is present in society. And institutions have to engage with this and open up and, uh, to this more grassroots, uh, underdocumented, informal ways of culture. And from combining these different forms of culture, I think very interesting things can come out. Rich. Very rich. Eh, andiamo avanti con un po' di domande che vengono da Menti, Menti Meter. Ce n'era una per eh, Wesley, eh, sono un po' in scorso, eccolo qui, Wesley e Victoria. How do you feel I think that answer, like, I'm actively working through that answer right now as an educator. Um, so I have a few, I have a few answers. Uh, I have a couple answers. I have a few, but I'll just do a couple. Um, one is related to activism and education and design is thinking about the time that it takes. So whenever you're thinking about activism, whenever you're thinking about movement building, it slows things down to a pace that does not, that say things like capitalism don't understand, right? So you're doing things that are actually counter to what design is actually made for when you're thinking about activism because when you're talking about intersectionality, that means you have to take an account for, you actually have to have space for, you have to have people hold their own space which means it takes time. So inefficiency goes, efficiency goes kind of out of the window, right? And that's kind of counterintuitive to design as well. Also within education, you actually have to think about time. Um, and so I would say traditionally when you're thinking about young designers in the classroom trying to make a change or an impact on communities or issues such as immigration, um, such as like, economic disparity, such as food sovereignty, right? These are actually massive, massive issues that go back decades, if not centuries, right? But then you expect 20-year-olds, 18-year-olds, 19-year-olds to deal with these institutional, systematic-wide things. That's one thing that should be thrown out of the window. 20-year-olds and 18-year-olds should not be given automatic clearance to just go work on these projects just because there's a notion, right? Um, so that's one thing. So one thing that I work on in the classroom is actually slowing it all the way down so students understand what these frameworks are, some of the root issues are. And we don't go out into the field. Like, 
We don't build, we don't like do branding for community projects and things like that, which at times can be helpful. But when we talk about harm benefit analysis, actually, when you're thinking about like what is, is branding and the act of branding actually harmful? And so you can ask these questions of these community groups and say, do you want to perpetuate these things that actually have enacted harm on you and your community? Um, so question action, question asking, framework building, um, critical analysis is a start. And I would say I'm starting to see some of these things being built into different pedagogies um, and different like school curriculums like around the country in the US. Yeah, the only the only thing I would add is exactly what Wes said, like what we've been noticing with the Design Justice Network and the principles is like more and more people reaching out to ask like what do I do with them? How do I bring this into my curriculum or put this into my the, the book that I'm writing or how do I share these with more people? And um, we have put um, just Creative Commons license, like you can use it, please use it, distribute it, share it amongst your networks and friends. Um, and also, like we are talking about this weekend, like evolve it as well, like be in touch and say like, oh, this part, or you're missing something really key here, and let's change it and evolve it. Um, and even I was talking with Nadia about uh, about like, the students in the classes that she's working with, like starting from when they're really young, talking about these principles, um, at, like principles of design, principles of justice, um, and just having conversations with people, um, rather than what I experience often is like criticism of people's opinions and thoughts, but it's okay to ask questions, engage people, ask them more questions about what they are asking you about to try to change the narrative of the way that they are thinking um, and putting it really real in front of people. Um, just, I think Nadia was giving me one example. Is it okay I'm saying this? Yeah, just of like students in the classroom that were, um, uh, I forget the example now, but if they said something wrong, like they uh, misgendered someone or they are criticizing someone because of their race. Like it's okay to ask questions and, and change that narrative. Beh, si torna alle origini, eh? come dire, parlare, eh, confrontarsi, fare domande. Eh, L'ABC della convivenza si civile, le abbiamo perso le tracce talvolta. Dunque, innanzitutto le persone che sono qui, se vogliono, se hanno curiosità, eh, domande da fare ai nostri speaker, siete assolutamente benvenuti eh, per delle domande. E io vado avanti intanto con quelle che ci stanno arrivando sulla piattaforma e Mario ce n'è una per te, mh, e che ti chiede qual è stato, cioè ti chiedono qual è stato l'ostacolo più grosso che hai trovato, eccolo qui, l'ostacolo più grande che avete dovuto superare per permettere al progetto dell'orchestra di Piazza Vittorio di andare avanti. Qual è stata la cosa più difficile? Guarda, proprio in grandissima sincerità l'orchestra stessa, cioè nel senso, noi abbiamo un, un, un grosso difetto che è proprio nella comunicazione, cioè infatti lo dimostra il fatto che non siamo riusciti a farvi vedere una... E, e un pezzo del nostro concerto al vivo e facciamo 120 concerti, 120 concerti l'anno e questo è un nostro difetto enorme sulla comunicazione siamo carenti e poi gli ostacoli io mi ricordo che quando eh, dipendono da, dalla qualità di quello che fai tutte le cose che avevano una qualità più alta hanno avuto una vita migliore quelle di qualità più bassa sono morte prima per cui anche quello che volevo dire la, la qualità di quello che fai determina poi la, vi, la vita stessa di quello che fai Insomma, è centrale dal punto di vista organizzativo istituzionale noi in realtà anche quello è un altro nostro grosso, grosso difetto non abbiamo mai fatto conto sulle istituzioni e non siamo capaci di parlare con le istituzioni eh, eh, perché eh, 
è una questione proprio di carattere perché siete nati perché dalla siamo, strada è che perché siamo nati da lì per cui in, 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 nella strada da, da la, sì, eh, eh, diciamo siamo qualche volta eccessivamente conflitto sto facendo un'analisi proprio da psicanalisi siamo, siamo qualche volta eh, eh, conflittuali eh, nel senso che ci poniamo eh, con le istituzioni eh, in maniera conflittuale perché non riusciamo ad essere accondiscendenti su quello che, eh, che, che dovremmo dare in cambio in qualche maniera, per cui soffriamo del fatto di stentare eh, e, e di eh, autofinanziarci perché continuiamo l'orchestra si alimenta del lavoro che fa eh, i, i nostri eh, paghiamo gli stipendi con eh, il risultato dei concerti del, dei dischi de, de, degli spettacoli e quindi questo forse perciò dice, dicevo che l'ostacolo grosso dell'orchestra è l'orchestra stessa e adesso arriva Culture Labs perché Culture eh certo, Labs è esattamente, esattamente. una cosa che facilita questo tipo di progetti e lo dicevo proprio cioè, per tu questo. sei il progetto e non avevi il modo di assolutamente siamo complementari in qualche maniera infatti, infatti gli esempi no. servono per questo io adesso ho una domanda non so chi mi può rispondere probabilmente un pezzetto della risposta ce l'avete tutti, ognuno di voi mi può dare un pezzetto della risposta. Mi ha molto interessato il progetto della radio, molto interessato il progetto delle radio ehm, e trovo che sia quello uno strumento straordinario perché comunque il gap, il digital gap è ancora tanto nei vari paesi perché gli anziani non, 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 non sanno usare troppo queste tecnologie quindi sono abbastanza fuori. E lo strumento radio è uno strumento eccezionale allora mi chiedevo se state pensando nel vostro progetto in Culture Labs anche un utilizzo delle radio, è la domanda che cercavo di farti un po' prima per comunicare eh, per restare in comunicazione con i, paesi, in, in, con i paesi da dove originano i flussi migratori io so che eh, Bruxelles qualche anno fa ha provato a fare un piano di eh, eh, cioè ha provato andare nei paesi mh, mh, con cose molto banali un po' col web addirittura con alcuni volantini per spiegare partire non partire perché partire in che modo di chi fidarsi di non di, di chi cioè banalmente c'è un problema di comunicazione enorme con i paesi da dove originano i flussi avete pensato di ehm, come dire, usare il vostro progetto anche in questa direzione, cioè per cercare di gestire meglio i flussi delle persone che partono e che vogliono arrivare in Europa? Some of, Irina first, so, and after that Nadia, maybe. Okay. This, I think it should be the schedule, the, better, the best schedule. Yeah, so uh, the project Nadia talked about was about literally giving voice to people. And we take it more metaphorically, but of course there is an obvious connection there. And, okay, in the project um, we had not considered this possibility that actually we can connect voices from across the world. And, it is exact and this uh, technology in this project offers exactly that. So not only to connect migrants who have already come uh, here, but also um, people who live in other countries and either consider to migrate or um, want to learn about European history. And on the other hand, we want to learn about uh, their culture, heritage. So this is a, a grassroots and uh, digitally empowered way to support this. So, yes, this opens new possibilities, I think. Um, I was thinking, like I said, our project was an innovation project, but in practice, if you think about it, it's all about, you know, culture and heritage. It's all about, you know, things that are meaningful to people and they can be, they can be a lot of them around culture and heritage, but they can also be about health and about more basic kind of needs, and that's the power of radio. It can be anything from news to connecting to just listening to music and having a good time. Um, but I was also kind of thinking when, when I heard this morning more about the Culture Labs kind of project, how um, 
It is definitely an interesting aspect thinking about the migrants. So we see in our projects a lot of the communities that we, we work with, because they're so isolated, they have a very big kind of uh, migration. So people that have, um, is it immigrated? Sorry, my <laughs> I'm not a native English speaker either, so I'm double jeopardy here. So, <laughs> so, so they have people that have left those villages and they've gone like to the US, you know, to other parts of the world. And the radio has given them a way, the online component of it, to kind of connect with this diaspora, basically. So it could be that it's almost like the other way around. It could be that something that can be used for people who are about to come to the country and or still have family somewhere else and it can connect in this way. So thinking about social inclusion, you know, from that kind of perspective, but also something that can be used to um, connect the migrant communities with the other kind of, you know, communities of place, the local kind of communities. So I think there's definitely a lot of potential there. Potrebbe essere un'ottima idea da sviluppare. E qui c'è un'altra domanda eh, che io girerei sempre in prima battuta a mm, 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 Irina. How do we listen to the heritage and culture of migrant communities rather than just tell them about our, our own? Yes, uh, this is a concern that has been expressed also by uh, many people uh, we have uh, interviewed. Um, and um, it is something also uh, acknowledged like an attitude uh, present in, especially in many institutions, but also among us, um, I mean, uh, the local people, that we are not open to listen uh, to migrants and uh, to their ideas. Um, so from the perspective of institutions, and this was also the experience of the orchestra, uh, they are not, many of them are not uh, ready to open up uh, to these uh, grassroots ideas. Um, there, there is prejudice and um, also often communities lack the tools and the means uh, for the voices to be heard. Um, so, yes, institutions have to change. and. This is one of the main uh, also objectives towards which Culture Labs uh, wants to contribute uh, because institutions have facilities, um, can offer their expertise, uh, can support very interesting projects. And it is a pity uh, that um, these two parts, institutions and communities, still are uh, apart in many cases. Prima si diceva, eh, mi pare tu Nadia dicessi che nel in giro di un anno o due ci saranno, in un anno ci saranno 50 miliardi di eh, device connet, connessi nel mondo, no? era un dato che stavi dando tu prima, quindi siamo tutti molto con me, connessi, però non sappiamo le cose, è un paradosso ma è la verità, eh, non, cioè, ci sono, siamo travolti dalle informazioni ma non le sappiamo comunicare. Credo che questo sia soprattutto, anche questo sia il vostro, lo scopo del vostro progetto, comunicare le cose, spiegare che esistono e che, 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 che funzionano soprattutto. Un'altra domanda, ehm, technology can be cold and frightening, how do we bring empathy into technological innovation? Ne avete parlato un po', un po' tutti nei vostri interventi, non so chi vuole rispondere. Se volete rispondere eh, Wesley, eh, would you want you to answer to this question? Or, or Nadia, or Irina, please, up to you. I could try something, I mean... Uh, Because... Yeah, I mean... This is true. Yeah, I'm, so <laughs> as, as not a, a technologist, right, but as somebody that thinks about systems and things like that, um, and I work towards um, re, like breaking down structures and then trying to understand them and then thinking about what's going on. Um, one question that I would have is this idea of empathy itself. Uh, and what the goals of empathy are when you talk about it. 
So when you, when you use the word empathy, it already sets up a hierarchy. Somebody that you have to feel in order to understand them, um, meaning that you actually have to come down to somebody's level um, in order to feel them, right? So the word empathy actually has a lot of things, not to say that also it is a bad word, um, but that is why, like, I guess when we started to use design justice as a framework, justice is actually a, another word that plugs in for empathy and other words that actually gets to the root of kind of the things that we're trying to solve, right? We're not actually trying to get people to feel in somebody's shoes, we're actually trying to get people to do, right? And that's a whole different thing. Empathy also stops at a feeling um, and actually a lot of times can lead to an action but when you use the word empathy, it actually just stops at that word. And so thinking about empathy in tech, there's a lot because we have biases in tech that we, is really hard to get around, right? When we're talking about AI, when we're talking about um, algorithms and the algorithms that we use to um, govern there are so many implicit biases in these things that empathy, we can't even talk about empathy yet. Um, when we have sensors that actually can't see black skin or dark skin, right? When we have facial technology that is only trained on white faces, and then when you're talking about recognizing other faces, then it doesn't do that, right? You don't need a computer to be empathetic, right? You actually need to change systems in order for the people in the room when they're testing out these technologies to actually be in proximity to these things when they're being built from the ground up. Um, so those are things that are really essential. Uh, and I'll, I'll just stop there. How? How what? How you... Come, come voi potete intervenire perché questa tecnologia uh, acquisti un po' di empatia? Um, like I would say you, you understand proximity. When we talk about inclusion, right, inclusion has to happen immediately at all levels. And so when you look in a room, in a design room or a tech room, and it is all homogeneous, right, then you are missing the point immediately, right? When you're having people be spokespersons for other people, right, if you look around the room and they're saying like, how do we do A-B testing with this community and this community and that community is not represented, then it's not, it's not gonna be reflective of your goals as a, as a designer. So I would say empathy gets missed every single time when proximity, inclusion are not centered and essential to any tech piece that you're working on. And, and, and that can go back to like pipeline. It could also go back to who you are inviting in the room, right? And how you invite people in a room. Like uh, some of the practices that I have with some of my collective and my art practices, we do this thing called um, intentional inv invitation. And intentional invitation means it is not just an email, it is several emails. These are um, customized invites for people into the room. You, or you go and find like who are the people doing the work. You find out who are those people, why are they not around. Because the question is, the assumption is that they don't exist and they exist all over the place and they get looked over. And that's usually the answer to why they're not in the room. And so, um, yeah, that's, I'll leave that there. Can I ask something? Yeah, please. Uh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I totally agree with around, you know, the implicit bias and now technology has a lot of that. But, uh, and I think the empathy, I have a bit of a disagreement. I think it's a misunderstood word and I think, um, it's not about going down to someone else's level. I think empathy is about, you know, uh, equally looking at others and, you know, thinking about them as equals and recognizing them. So it has a political and social meaning into that. But to go back to the implicit bias, that's exactly kind of the, so who is training those algorithms? Who is choosing the white data sets? It's Però, us, scusa, it's people. Al punto, scusami se ti interrompo, hai detto la parola giusta, guardarsi alla pari. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Tu hai detto, hai usato, hai, hai usato una parola chiave, guardarsi alla pari. 
guardarsi, quindi questo è importante, deve essere fondamentale perché a volte succede che insomma non c'è tutta questa eh, semplicità o questo guardarsi alla pari in questi contesti, quindi yes. questo è fondamentale. I agree, when I say we're at the same level, we're at the same level as human beings, we all need to eat, we all need to breathe, so this is the most basic that it happens and I think empathy has to come back to that basic level. So, of course, I'm not saying we're all equal, we're not, that's, the, that's one of our problems, that we are not. So we have to try and think about, you know, why is that, uh, and how we can kind of, you know, understand each other better. And just to go back to the implicit kind of bias, I mean, who is, I was saying, who is training, who is doing all this, you know, uh, it's us, it's coming back to us. So I agree with Wesley that, you know, we need to, uh, think about who is part of that decision making, who are inviting, who is participating. But I think it needs to start much earlier. I think in a way it seems from all these biases that we have that there is a need that this education, this kind of, I don't know, sensitizing, I guess, to start much earlier, start before we are in the workforce. It has to start from when we are children again. And for me, one of the main ways that this can happen is with this kind of exposure to, to, diverse, to diversity, to other people, to other cultures. So it all comes back to that again. Yes, please, of course. <laughs> you have to. So again, with the role of uh, technology with respect to empathy, yes, empathy is important and technology helps uh, or contributes to empathize with others. Uh, let's think about putting a like on a, on a Facebook post uh, when someone shares an interesting experience that creates empathy on Facebook. But I also agree that we sh technology and also our role and um, objective should not stop there. I see it as more important that technology should facilitate and enable action, activism, uh, so it's not enough to understand how people in difficult situations live, but rather uh, it is even more important, this is of course the first step, but it is also more important to try and help them and participate together with them to um, go out of this difficult uh, circumstances or the situation that causes our empathy. So yes, technology for action is also an important uh, thing for me. Io volevo uscire un attimo da domande, ce ne sono ancora però, andiamo veloci, lo so, mi state guardando già malissimo, però volevo chiedere a, a Bib, eh, che tipo di difficoltà, se ne state trovando, o che, che tipo di difficoltà eventualmente trovate nel vostro progetto in questo momento, visto che Irina è qui, se c'è qualcosa che, vo che vuoi anche condividere con lei sulle vostre difficoltà, se ce ne sono, eh? quello che riguarda il vostro progetto. Okay. So I will talk about um, the project that I'm working on, uh, since I can't talk on behalf of others. Um, but basically, um, we are trying to challenge um, and do things in a different way. Um, although we consider like the city where we are in um, a more, much more progressive than other cities in terms of uh, this type of work, but still, there's much to be done. Um, the museum sector, for example, um, and all the um, uh, cultural institutions are uh, still much uh, like dominated by um, white uh, middle class or um, uh, staff, and, uh, um, and and it's still very much um, a place uh, that is scary. And <laughs> I think what was the word before, like. Uh, um, overwhelming for communities, so um, this is something that needs to be worked on and this builds on uh, the conversation that we were just having. It's, uh, it needs to be worked on radically from inside the institution. It's not something that can um, be fixed um, in a project or a million project. It's, it's much more deeper than that. Uh, but uh, from our position, we, we try to do things. <laughs> di una difficoltà impressionante, cioè, insomma, è la sfida proprio la sfida del, del secolo, del momento. Se si vince questa sfida, c'è una possibilità 
per l'umanità. Infatti per Mario, di... colgo l'occasione, rispondi tu a questa domanda, la cultura può sembrare distante dalle persone, come possiamo incoraggiarle a partecipare? Prova tu, visto Beh, che... Cioè, la distruzione della cultura eh, in Italia, per esempio, è un progetto politico. Eh, cioè, insomma, abbiamo iniziato 30 anni fa con Berlusconi a dire che chi, 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 sa, che si legge, chi, chi legge libri perde, cioè tempo da perdere. Tu leggi, quindi c'è un sacco di tempo per non lavorare. Quindi, e quindi è stato un progetto di distruzione proprio eh, politico eh, che, ha, che, che si è compiuta, ma non solo in Italia, penso sì, forse un po' meno in Canada, ma negli Stati Uniti, in qualsiasi altra parte eh, d'Europa, questo, questo è il progetto, cioè quello de che la cultura de deve essere distante dalle persone, perché così le masse si possano manovrare, ma questa è una cosa non dico una banalità per carità di Dio cioè, quindi il, il, la, la, la realtà risponderei a, 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 a questa domanda dicendo ma perché mi fai questa domanda ma per te la cultura è distante dalle persone, è un problema tuo è un problema tuo e soprattutto non lo dire mai se hai dei figli e tuo figlio cioè non te lo far scappare davanti ai tuoi figli una cosa del genere per, per favore perché il problema è quello, cioè, insomma, non è vero, non, non, non è vero. Beh, il problema è non anche è vero. confondere Io faccio, i facciamo... social con la cultura, attenzione. Ti assicuro Però che i teatri, sarebbe i teatri tema di un altro purtroppo dibattito. non di giovani, ma i teatri, sono, ringraziando di Dio, sono sempre pieni. Sì. Che cosa, cosa la gente è ancora disposta a vedere? Delle cose che non sono riproducibili. Allora, il cinema la gente ci va sempre di meno perché è riproducibile, perché lo riuscirei a vedere fra due mesi in televisione nel calduccio della tua casa dopo che hai parlato su Facebook con i tuoi amici e hai detto adesso ci vediamo la serie, la commentiamo, like. Ecco, anche questo secondo me bisogna cambiare di questo mondo, il significato delle parole. Io mi ricordo, ho 60 anni e faccio questo mestiere grazie alla tecnologia, perché i miei genitori non volevano che facessi il musicista, per cui ho dovuto lavorare e grazie a un programma, eh, che si, non mi ricordo neanche come si chiama, ho imparato a leggere e a scrivere la musica. Un programma del, del computer, grazie al computer. Quindi io la per me la tecnologia è stata fondamentale per fare il mio mestiere. Però quanta fatica facevo a 30 anni a dire una, a una cosa a una persona... I like. Quanta importanza ora... davo ai la, a, alla parola I like, a mi piace. Adesso, cioè, questa, parola, questa cosa ha perso totalmente il suo significato. Ah, è Ed è questa la cosa che, di cui dobbiamo stare attenti. So romantic, Mario. Eh? So romantic. So romantic. So romantic. <ride> little bit. Senti, andiamo all'ultima domanda, che è small human... Ok, no, anche quell'altra era bella. Sì, dai, ne facciamo due. V very quick, try to be quick. Uh, small human center grassroots projects are possible, but how can we scale them up into mainstream projects without altering their real human center character? Who yeah. wants to answer? Irina, please. Irina first. Oh, okay. I'm holding <laughs> the microphone. No, but it's a, a question very relevant to culture. That's why I. <laughs> I took the microphone. So, um, because culture is, is, is about maintaining projects and about uh, bridging communities with institutions, but there is a, um, a difference in uh, balance. Uh, there are different power dynamics. Um, so, um, when a grassroots um, uh, initiative that uh, tries to Uh, support itself and be maintained outside of institutions, for example, an occupation, um, a, an initiative, um, an independent initiative, of course, has uh, a different character than one uh, that um, is hosted by an institution. Uh, but uh, again, I think that institution can offer very useful facilities, expertise, Um, financial support to such projects uh, without trying to intervene and change, uh, change their character. Yes, well that's, that's the million dollar question here. <laughs> I think 
for all of us who do this kind of participatory kind of grassroots work, this is the big challenge. Like that's what I was kind of saying in my talk as well. Uh, how we can scale up, how we can sustain this kind of innovation, the grassroots innovation in the long term, uh, without changing what makes it, you know, um, meaningful for the people. I think it's about finding that balance between, um, like I said, the governance and some kind of way of, um, I don't want to call it a monetary kind of system because I don't think it's necessarily about monetary, but there has to be some form of kind of reward, some form of compensation so that people take something back. The people who put their souls, you know, put their work, you know, put their time there, the grassroots kind of, they have to be able to, to take something back. And it could be anything from, you know, we're thinking about kind of circular economy, you know, approaches and platforms. Don't, not everybody, you know, someone needs someone to come and fix their, their uh, I don't know, oven or something, and the other person needs someone to teach them Italian. So they're not the same, but they're equally important for those people. So it could be that there's some kind of uh, model like that, that we can kind of combine that, um, you know, personal, the human kind of aspect, the, the, and, and kind of still be able to um, make it worthwhile for people to continue participating, to continue contributing in these grassroots kind of platforms and approaches. Wesley, start from you, please. All right. I can sum it up by saying the internet is an asshole. And it pretty much proves itself to you as an asshole almost every day. Um, and so I don't know, right? Because w when you think about all the ways that, like in the US, we have a term, you get got. And the internet can get you in so many ways as far as like bills without explanation, right? Um, charge increases, um, cutting off of services for whatever reason, right? If you had like that relationship with a human being, right, you would not keep that type of relationship going. Um, and so I don't, you know, just to leave it like that, I'm just coming to the realize, realization that this relationship that I have with this thing is based on like, I have to like, take it almost every single time and there's no like there's no um feedback loop right with me and this thing and, and so we can figure out how to build that in um you know that might be cool uh and i don't i don't know the the broader like ways to do that and just like one thing just to go back about scale um and thinking about scale is thinking about grassroots and understanding like this idea of metrics, right? What are we measuring when we talk about scale? Why do we even measure those things? So when we talk about impact, we talk about people being hit or hits or unique hits, right? Why is that even a metric that we use? Um, and why is that applicable when we're talking about startup culture, right? We talk about startup culture, starting a Twitter, when you're starting a Facebook, right? Those metrics work. But when you're talking about imposing those structures on the grassroots organizations and grassroots movements, the translation doesn't always work, right? And so you actually have to come up with brand new metrics when you talk about scale and also understand like, do we really need to privilege mainstream large scale things over small scale, um, very localized things, right? And so if we can privilege localized movements things such as uh, culture labs, such as like or orchestras that are happening in a very localized way, we understand like that is the scale that they need to be, not restricting them, but understanding like that is perfectly good and having institutions understand those scales as being very viable and valid, then I think there's other shifts where we're not thinking about, you know, startup culture language and thinking about scaling up things when they should not scale. Okay. You and, want yeah, and and also what I would add to what Wes said is like, yeah, the internet is an asshole, but 
but there are other ways that we can use it and a lot of the community organizations that we live and work in are using it for positive things. They're turning the dial on what those things are. Um, a couple weekends ago in Toronto, I was on a panel with some other Toronto organizers and one of the groups is called Maggie's Sex Workers Action Organization and they do amazing work to support sex workers on the ground in the city. Um, and what they spoke about, and I give this credit to them, like they spoke about how the internet and using Facebook and using social media really helps them grow their network to help support the people that need that support and that protection, and they're able to do it. And the example that the woman spoke about was that one of their uh, people that came into their office every single day um, all of a sudden one day she disappeared and for 48 hours nobody could figure out where she is um, and after I think it's after 24 hours in Toronto you can go and report a missing person to the police and the police did not take it seriously at all and it was three months later that they still had not done anything and found this woman and what that organization did was organized and mobilized using Facebook, using their social media, calling out the police and saying, you're not doing your job, you're supposed to be um, finding our missing person and you need to do it. So you know what, we will um, turn this around, we're gonna use your tools against you and they organized um, community uh, search parties to find this woman and, and after three months they found out that she she had died but then they used it that other mobilization that happened there to um, change that dynamic against the police people now know that they're not doing this they're not looking for they're not searching for sex workers they're not doing their job around people of color they're just further marginalizing them so part of what our role is to use that technology um, to switch the narrative on what the mainstream is doing. And then going back to the idea of apathy, which is what Wes had spoke about. Empathy, yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, but I was thinking about the consentful tech zine and thinking about how, like myself, I'm a white woman settler, so when I am Oh, the things that I'm able to do and say are very vastly different from a what a person of color would be able to do or say. And so part of what my role is, is to advocate that, advocate for that, like advocate to have more diverse um, groups in my workplace or advocate for um, changing the social media platforms, whether that is like mass massively um, emailing and messaging Facebook to change um, some of the, the algorithms that they're doing or um, using the, the platforms that we have available. And I'm not saying that emailing your government officials always works, but if enough people are doing it and enough of us are kind of pushing for that, we can, we can change that narr narrative and, and ask for people to be on our teams that should, that should be there in that room. And the other part is like getting out of it if you feel that it doesn't go against your principles. So, if, And one thing I've learned is principles can really take a place and hold a place if you use them in your own work or if you use them in a workplace, you can use them to change that narrative. Capo Volgere. Sì. Molto interessante quello che dici, ma però forse, forse il risultato migliore sarebbe che queste persone che scrivono le mail producano una propria persona che poi sia, sia, ad, sia pronta per guidare il paese. Seco, seco, cioè, secondo Mario, me... Mario, questa è un'altra storia. Non possiamo parlare di questo oggi. Scusate. Sarebbe molto interessante, ma non possiamo. Sarebbe molto interessante. Allora, Irini, eh, I hope it, so io spero che sia stato un pomeriggio pieno di spunti per you, per il tuo progetto. Um, maybe next year, il prossimo anno, magari ci raccontate come sta andando il progetto. 
tornerete? Anche perché Pisa è coinvolta nel progetto, quindi dobbiamo assolutamente sapere come va. E io credo, non so se c'è qualcuno che... Scusate, se c'è qualcuno che vuole chiedere ancora qualcosa, ma non credo, quindi io ringrazio tutti. Adesso ricordarmi tutti i nomi sarà difficilissimo. Eh, allora, Wesley, thank you so much. Eh, Victoria, thank you so much. Nadia, thank you so much. Irini, thank you. First of all, no? Ho sbagliato qualcosa? Irini? Ok. Mario, te sei il nome più facile. Abib? Abir, sorry. Ok, io vi ringrazio, no scusami, grazie a te di tutto. Mm. Elena? Ecco, vi ho, li ho salutati tutti, scusate ma sono stati veramente tanti, siamo stati qui un sacco di tempo. Irini vuoi chiudere ancora con qualcosa, vuoi dire qualcosa? Per chiudere questo panel? Okay. Posto? Thank you and probably indeed next week, uh, next year I next will year. be able to present the... I, I will be here next year and I want to <laughs> care about you and your project, Culture Lab project. Thank you so much to everybody. Bye-bye.